today is hypertension specifically. High blood pressure. One of a um, host of modifiable lifestyle factors that can severely um, limit normal function and uh, predict chronic disease that is completely preventable and manageable with lifestyle and dietary intervention. High blood pressure. What does it mean? How does it develop? How can we treat it? That's what we're looking at in this section. So for our purposes moving forward, this is a sustained elevation in systemic pressure. Sustained, a habitual, um, a free living day to day elevation in systemic blood pressure. And that's different from an acute elevation in systemic blood pressure. If you were to jump up out of your seat right now, blood pressure would spike quickly. If you jumped out of your seat, ran out of class, and then started running, went for a jog for whatever reason, blood pressure has to go up to be able to accomplish the exercise. And that's normal. Blood pressure increases with exercise. That's not hypertension. It's sustained elevation of systemic blood pressure during normal day-to-day -day activities that constitutes hypertension. And these guidelines have recently been modified. The American Heart Association, two years ago I think now, changed their guidelines to be a bit more aggressive. Hypertension is now considered systolic blood pressure over 130. It used to be 140 millimeters of mercury. And arresting diastolic blood pressure over 80 millimeters of mercury. It used to be 90. Normal blood pressure should be 120 over 80, correct? I think you knew that coming in. So there's a little bit of play or flexibility in the systolic measurement, but if diastolic pressure, the resting tension in the arteries is higher than normal, that's a characteristic sign of high blood pressure. Hypertension, stage one, uh, 130 over 80 or between 130 and 139 over 80 to 89. But the, the initial, um, the start to that range is 130 over 80. So the range between that is now what we call pre-hypertension or a situation where you are at risk of developing hypertension. Hypertension is now 130 over 80, which is very close to normal and resting, but this highlights how important it is to address and keep tabs on, how um, impactful it is on the, the negative side effects of other cardiovascular disease in the body. So a normal individual that exhibits blood pressures over these thresholds is considered hypertensive. The higher they are, the, the uh, more severe the hypertension is. You can see down here, higher than uh, 150 and higher than 120 are considered a hypertensive crisis. See your doctor immediately. But that's not during exercise. You, you will see pressures like this during exercise if you do moderate to high intensity exercise. If you're healthy, it's fine. It's not a problem. Morning. <clears throat> if you are an individual that is taking hypertensive medication, that might help control your blood pressure and maybe they don't fall so far outside of this range, but clearly you've been diagnosed previously, you're taking hypertensive medication, and so that in and of itself defines you having hypertension. In this case, there is a reason um, or, or a method of counteracting that high blood pressure, and so the readings that you get might not be <laughs> accurate of a free living situation, the fact that you're ta uh, taking antihypertensive medication dictates that you have high blood pressure. It's been diagnosed in the past. And our best estimates are that the risk of a cardiovascular event, of cardiovascular disease, um, infarction or stroke or some impact related to cardiovascular disease, doubles with every uh, 20 millimeters of mercury systolic pressure or 10 millimeters of mercury diastolic pressure. The risk doubles every additional 20 over 10 millimeters of mercury that you can register in the uh, vasculature. It's a relatively small change or double the risk 
of a coronary or a cardiovascular event. It's really important to be able to keep tabs on this and lower it if at all possible. Prevent it if we can, but if it's already high, lower it if at all possible. Major priority. So, how do these adjustments in the guidelines impact the prevalence across the population? Being that this is American Heart Association, we'll take a quick look at the American numbers. The Canadian numbers are, uh, I couldn't find as detailed numbers on them, but where we used to have one in three Americans with hypertension, according to these new gu uh, guidelines, one in two adults has hypertension. Another 30% moved into this classification just by changing the threshold. 30% of the population overnight had hypertension, according to the American Heart Association. In Canada, the numbers that I can find, the best numbers are one in five, but these are according to the old guidelines. I don't, I don't think that Canada has updated their guidelines yet. That might be outdated information, but at the time that I made these, it was one in five. This was last year that I updated them. Um, we're going to take a look at the, the prevalence across the age range in the population between men and women, and then again we'll drill down into Antigonish proper just to see what it's all about. We're doing a little bit better than the states, but that's still not great. 20% of the adult population has, um, has hypertension, and this clearly goes up with age. You'll see that in a slide coming up. Most chronic diseases, the prevalence tends to increase with age. We talk about... Um, high salt intake as a risk factor for hypertension, or uh, high fat intake as a risk factor for atherosclerosis or cardiovascular disease, we're starting to realize age is the biggest risk factor for the development of chronic disease. If given enough time, it seems that these diseases will develop. And that's a really interesting concept that we'll circle back to at the end of the course when we have... Um, just a one-week primer on aging as a disease, aging as a chronic condition, which hopefully will lead nicely into Dr. Kane's uh, aging physiology course. It's a really interesting topic. Aging is the largest risk factor in the development of disease, and we'll see that um, in a graph in two slides. <clears throat> I did find some more in, uh, updated information on the Canadian process for diagnosis. This is, uh, okay, I can't, it's the 2018 Canada guidelines. I'm not sure what online CJC means, but this is the uh, most recent Canadian guidelines for diagnosing high blood pressure in the population, and it helps to differentiate between those individuals that just get really ramped up when they're at the doctor. White, ho uh, white coat hypertension is the name for that. And so you can follow this flow chart through, and if you have some unofficial elevated reading, maybe you have an automated blood pressure monitor at home, or you went to the pharmacy, or you were in lab, and you got a reading, it's an unofficial reading, that if it suggests high blood pressure, you would go to a dedicated professional to get it uh, checked accurately. If on this visit your blood pressure is over 180 over 110, that's extremely high. That's the hypertensive crisis situation. If that's the case, absolutely, you have hypertension. If that's not the case, if your blood pressure is below it, Canada separates out those with diabetes versus not. And this is because diabetes will impact the, um, the risk of an adverse effect with hypertension. It's a modifiable risk factor, so to speak. So if you have diabetes and then your um, AOBP is automated office blood pressure, so this is standardized in a clinic blood pressure with no bias, with high-tech equipment. If that, again, shows as over 130 over 80, yes, you have hypertension if you're diabetic. If you don't have diabetes and you're not above these thresholds, no hypertension. But if you are above these thresholds, it's possible you have hypertension. It's also possible you're just stressed about being in this office at the prospect of having hypertension. And maybe you're exhibiting 
white coat hypertension, a phenomenon where you're stressed by having your blood pressure taken at the doctor. So if you don't have diabetes and you're above this certain threshold, they'll send you out with ambulatory blood pressure measurements. Free living, walking around in society, blood pressure measurements to see if your day-to-day -day blood pressure is indeed above these thresholds or not. If it's above 135 over 85 during the day or a slightly different threshold at night where blood pressure should be lower, then yes, you have hypertension. If not, that means, well, your free living blood pressure is not that bad. It was only at the doctor's office where it was high or where it had spiked that indicates you are susceptible to white, uh, white coat hypertension. I'm blanking on the name for the opposite effect. <clears throat> there is an opposite effect which isn't as common where individuals will go to get their blood pressure taken and it reads artificially lower. Usually you can spin it as their day-to-day -day life is really stressful or maybe they're worried about relationship issues but then when they get to the doctor it's a safe place, the time is set aside and they can relax and their blood pressure is artificially lower than it would be walking around. It's not common I'm blanking on the name. I'll think about that and I'll, uh, I'll make sure to let you guys know. Certainly not common, not a factor that really uh, we have to worry about. If we follow this through for most individuals in the population and we try to graph out what it looks like over time, or, or over age rather, this is the prevalence for women up until 2012 in Canada. You can see a general progression where from 2002 all the way to 2012, there's been a gradual increase at any given point over the life cycle. At any given age, the incidence of hypertension has been increasing in recent years. And certainly, this is weighted towards the right side of the graph. The older you are, the more likely you are to have hypertension. Prevalence of hypertension is 70 80% in those above 75 years old. Really striking. And it might simply be that they're taking antihypertensive medication and so they're classified as hypertensive, but they're doing that for a reason. This graph looks a lot like the same graph for men. Weighted towards the right-hand side, age is the, the largest risk factor in developing hypertension, and we see an increase over time with these lines being gradually pushed upwards. 2011, 2012, a higher prevalence rate than in 2002, 2003. So certainly, cause for concern, if this does double the risk of cardiovascular events with every 20 over 10 millimeter of mercury increase in blood pressure, something should be done look at what the things are that can be done coming up. For us locally, Antigonish is worse than Nova Scotia, which is worse than Canada. Blood pressure in Antigonish County is 10% higher than Canada at the national average, 5% higher than Nova Scotia overall. No difference between men and women. We are equally worse off, which is somewhat unfortunate. And I keep referencing the idea that it's due to all these other lifestyle factors, and I've put a couple up here just to, to show you, to frame it a little bit. Um, relatively high incidence of smoking, heavy drinking, although county, Antigonish County is lower than the Nova Scotian average, which maybe they took these numbers when school wasn't in session. I'm not sure. That's somewhat surprising. Uh, leisure time, physical activity, now a lower number is worse lower than Nova Scotia, which is on par with Canada overall. Fruit and vegetable intake, again, a lower number is worse. Really low um, percentage of individuals that get an adequate five-time fruit and vegetable consumption during a day. Uh, lower than Nova Scotia and lower than Canada overall. All of these factors we'll see are um, factors that will modify hypertension. Salt intake, fruit and vegetable intake, uh, grain intake, leisure time, physical activity, all are independent and additive factors that will help lower blood pressure.
and they're all pointed in the wrong direction here. Least physical activity, least fruit and vegetable intake, so that's bad news. Now, as far as hypertension goes and understanding it as a concept, what we are focused on in this course is essential hypertension or primary hypertension. This is the hypertension associated with lifestyle. Hypertension that is idiopathic, meaning it's difficult to determine one underlying cause. There are many factors, a constellation of factors that uh, could be contributing to hypertension as a phenomenon in this case. Poor lifestyle choices, it could be uh, waist to hip ratio, BMI, being overweight, high salt intake, any number of factors <clears throat> that contribute to, for instance, the metabolic syndrome that might help with uh, determining primary or essential hypertension. Genetics might come into play in this case. There might be salt sensitivity or um, different responses to varying circulating hormones. It's hard to pinpoint one specific cause. This is different from secondary hypertension where there is a clear deficit in function. For instance, the kidneys being unable to efficiently handle sodium, to reabsorb sodium or excreting too much sodium, that's one specific deficiency in one system of the body that we can pinpoint. And that might contribute to changes in blood pressure that we're not excited about, but it's not due to a host of lifestyle factors. It's uh, a specific limitation in one area of the body. Or maybe um, hormones aren't released properly, um, the adrenal glands or the, uh, the fluid, uh, the, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system might not be activated properly in some individuals for varying reasons. Those are issues that we can point to and say, that's the reason blood pressure is impacted. It's, def it's easy to define. It's not a nebulous black box, which is the essential primary hypertension that we're considering in this uh, section. So being that it's difficult to pinpoint one cause... You can argue, well, why are we even talking about it if we don't know what causes hypertension? The reason, moving forward, is that whatever the cause, it's treatable. And we have really concrete evidence to say that even essential hypertension, not knowing what it is, can be modified and improved with various lifestyle strategies. For those of you that remember XFIS and in advance of labs four and five, I will put up this fundamental physiological equation. A higher blood pressure, sure, it can cause a whole host of vascular disease, stroke, cardiovascular events. If you register high blood pressure in the circulation, that means there must also be high cardiac output. That's what Q is. And or high total peripheral resistance. That's what TPR is. Because blood pressure in the body is a function of those two factors. Pressure in the arteries, wherever you measure it, is a measure or uh, it's contingent on how much blood you're trying to force into that area, cardiac output, and how large the area is, total peripheral resistance. If that area is relatively small, Trying to force more blood into it means there's more resistance to forcing that blood into that space. Blood pressure goes up. Or if you start to pump blood faster, you're trying to input more blood into that fixed space. Cardiac output goes up. Blood pressure will also go up. If both of these go up, then you get a much larger increase in blood pressure. But for blood pressure to be high one of these factors must also be higher. It can be either or it can be both. And we'll look at examples of uh, situations where it's either of those coming up. But I want to take a, a moment to briefly review how blood pressure is regulated. You've seen this in anatomy and physiology. 
probably. You've seen this in XFIS, probably. This is a classic negative feedback loop. This is the example we often use to teach you about feedback loops out of blood pressure. Blood pressure or temperature is also another really common one. Negative feedback loop monitors a variable of interest, and if it varies outside of a certain range, we'll work to correct it, to bring it back into that range. Right? Negative feedback loop, if something goes wrong, if it moves outside of the range, we'll notice that and work against it to bring it back. And blood pressure is one of those variables. Blood pressure is always being measured. Always being measured. We have baroreceptors in very special locations in the carotid arteries and the arch of the aorta, which measure as soon as the blood is released from the heart, pressure that's being delivered to the body in the case of the aorta, and then the pressure that's being delivered to the brain in the case of the carotid arteries. Because those are really important locations to make sure that blood pressure is adequate. We really want to make sure that blood pressure is adequate in supplying the brain. If it's not, you faint. And we want to make sure that blood pressure is adequate in supplying the rest of the body, which we measure at the aorta. If you don't, there might be some hypoxemia or blood, uh, blood delivery issues that we'd like to avoid. So we uh, measure blood pressure constantly through the uh, signals from these baroreceptors. And you remember how baroreceptors will signal the brain? There's a constant tone or a ping. Ping, ping, ping. Baroreceptors will constantly fire. And if the stretch goes up, if the pressure in the arteries go up, they'll fire faster. If it goes down, if blood pressure goes down, they'll fire slower. And it's the rate of firing that the brain measures or monitors. It's the rate of firing that the brain responds to. So in a situation where blood pressure is normal, something might uh, push it outside of its normal range, increasing blood pressure. That would be sensed by these baroreceptors. The pinging goes up, the frequency goes up. Those impulses are sensed by the cardiovascular center in the brain. There are a couple areas that we think are involved in that process. There are many centers that are involved in that process. And so we just label it cardiovascular center. There are regions that are specifically tasked with looking or watching the frequency of these baroreceptor pings. If the pings go up, it's, if it's too fast, we want to bring them back down into a normal range. So the cardiovascular center creates a plan. The plan is executed by various effector tissues. These are the things that can directly impact blood pressure. A couple examples are shown here. The sympathetic nervous system will deactivate slightly, dropping heart rate, lowering heart rate. It will lower the force of contraction of the heart. That's what contractility is. Ultimately, those things will lower cardiac output. CO on this slide is the same thing as Q on the last slide. If pressure is too high, we reduce Q. If you think about that equation, lowering Q on one side means the other side has to go down. Lowering Q will lower blood pressure. Other effector tissues are the arteries. What we can do is relax the arteries, make more space for the blood that's being pumped. And what we're doing by making more space is reducing the resistance, reducing total peripheral resistance. Again, that was on the right-hand side of that equation. Both of those factors are going down according to this plan, which means blood pressure would have to go down as well. Blood pressure is a function of those two variables in the body. So the brain responds to an accelerated signal from the baroreceptors. It creates a plan. That plan will lower cardiac output and peripheral resistance. 
By reducing those two factors, blood pressure naturally will drop to follow suit. And then if it drops back to within the normal range, good, we don't have to keep going. If it's still high, the loop continues. If it's too low, something else happens, but I've cut that out. That's at the bottom. If it's too low, the opposite happens. And I'll just leave it at that. So why do you ever develop hypertension? You would think if you were an individual, free living individual, and you um, were walking around and then your blood pressure went up to 130 over 80 or 135 over 85, and you are hypertensive by the new American Heart Association guidelines, that your body would just do this and bring you back down to normal. How are people hypertensive? Why doesn't this work all the time? Any idea? No idea? It does work. It tries to work. It tries to always return blood pressure to normal, but there are limits. Really, two things happen. If you are constantly insulting this system, you're constantly raising blood pressure by whatever means. Um, weight gain, salty foods, fat foods, lots of fluid intake. If you're always tipping the balance and trying to reduce blood pressure, your body is smart enough to say, well, you're always making blood pressure higher. I'm expecting it to be normal or lower, but you're telling me it should be higher. So what I'm going to do is change my expectation of what normal should be. It raises the set point. If you're always, through the lifestyle choices that you make, increasing systemic blood pressure, the brain will say, okay, well, this is my new normal. And now it's going to start to regulate around 130 over 80. Or 135 over 85. Or 150 over 110. The set point changes. The second thing is that if you always have this insult, if blood pressure goes up a lot, there's only so much you can do to turn down cardiac output and open up the arteries. Right? Can you turn heart rate down or, or completely off? You can't turn heart rate off. You can't turn contractility all the way down. You can't decrease cardiac output to near zero because then there's no blood flow. Then you die. Similarly, you can't open up the arteries too far. If you open up the arteries too far, it's like, um, this is a typical Canadian example. Let's say that... Um, you're a hockey player and you're making a backyard rink uh, to play hockey for your kids or for yourself or whoever in the, in the winter. You set up a hose and you turn the hose on and you can spray water all over the rink. Right? You've got some pressure in the hose because the, uh, the size of the hose limits the, uh, the amount of space and then water rushes out as a result. But if you take the hose away, you open up the, uh, the arteries as much as they can go and you just turn the tap on. You're going to pool water right by the tap, and it doesn't flow to where you want it to go. You need some resistance. You need the arteries to have some shape because it directs the flow of blood in the body. Without those arteries and the, the resistance they provide, there's no movement of blood. So there are limits. You can't turn these down too far, or else the system doesn't work. So what were the two things? 
I'm realizing it might have been good to, to list those two things in a bubble up here, but what were the two things? Why does hypertension persist? Why you become hypertensive? Set point goes up, absolutely. If you're always insulting it, if you're always saying, well, I want higher pressure, the body will respond by saying, okay, here's your higher pressure. Set point goes up and what are we just talking about? You can't turn down, you can't, you, you can't compensate endlessly. You can't open up the arteries completely, you can't turn the heart, uh, heart rate, the, the flow of blood from the heart down all the way. There are limits to how much you can compensate. I know. I saw the reflection of the, the light from your screen on your face change afterwards. So I don't know if you're like looking at something different. Maybe you're looking at your slides or slides, slides back and yeah. forth. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, like X-ring dresses or anything. That's coming up soon, right? Okay. Okay. Right. Set point resets, and you can't compensate endlessly. There are limits to how much you can turn down flow and open up the vasculature. So what goes wrong then with hypertension? What factors will accentuate hypertension? Those factors that we just talked about, the chronic expansion of blood volume, which essentially is the chronic insult, raising the set point and always trying to um, uh, regulate about a higher pressure, and reduced vessel compliance are factors that will uh, exacerbate these changes. And we'll talk about which, what each one of these means um, briefly. I'll highlight them on the next couple slides. But the hypertension will accelerate under these conditions. So if you are always trying to force more blood into the same space, blood pressure will go up. And then um, if blood vessel compliance is reduced, that is, if they're less springy, if they're harder, if there's cardiovascular disease that exists, that will also cause blood pressure to spike in certain situations, which can result in um, some pretty severe consequences. Overall, both of these things will increase the afterload of the heart. And this is a concept that we're not clear on yet, but that will come back when we talk about cardiac output in a couple uh, slide sets. But afterload is essentially the pressure that remains in the system at rest. When the heart's done pumping, it's the pressure that's left over after blood has been ejected. The afterload in the vasculature. The resting pressure in the vasculature. And this is important, not because the heart's done and this is what's left over, but because the next time the heart beats, this is what it has to work against. The afterload is what the heart has to overcome in order to pump blood to the rest of the body. And a high afterload be, means the heart has to work harder to do the same delivery that it would in a normotensive situation, a lower blood pressure situation. This is how we can start to see um, the progression of heart failure. These will gradually get worse and worse. The heart gradually has to do more and more work. There are limits to how much work the heart can do, just like we have a VO2 max. There's limits to how much exercise or work we can do. And at some point, the heart can fail. So what does it look like for blood volume to chronically expand? If you are trying to force, in this case I'm using a drop of water or a drop of fluid, but you can imagine this as being blood. If I'm always trying to force some amount of fluid into the uh, vasculature, that's fine. It can work normally. In fact, we want this to work in a certain way. There, there has to be some amount of fluid going in for there to be movement through the vasculature. But if you always try to force more and more fluid into the same small space, Imagine like it's being in a crowded room. Pressure goes up. Mm. 
this is typically a result of um, high sodium intake. There are arguments against that, uh, that interpretation lately. But I think it's pretty convincing that a, a high salt intake will promote the retention of fluid inside the, uh, the blood vessels. When we talked about um, setting up ECGs, remember we partitioned the ions. Lots of sodium outside. Lots of potassium inside. If you have a high sodium diet, where is it going to sit in the body? Outside of the cells. What's outside of the cells? Blood and interstitial fluid. So a lot of the extra sodium in your diet will sit in this space and it has this osmotic pull. We want concentration to always be constant in the body. If we have a lot of salt in the blood, it's going to draw more water into the blood to balance out the concentration. That is what I'm describing with these multiple large arrows. More fluid, more blood in that same small space. Pressure goes up. That, I think, is a fairly easy um, point to understand, but what's less intuitive is this idea of reduced vessel compliance. Normally, the arteries are, think of them as a springy rubber. They hold their shape really well. If you pump blood into them, if you inject some amount of fluid into them, they will, they will bound and then rebound. They stretch and then recoil. And that stretching is really important. They accept the blood that's being pumped in and then as they recoil, they push the blood downstream. And it's this recoiling effect that pushes the, uh, the blood all the way through the artery. So normally, when we pump blood in with every beat, we'll see an increase in pressure that returns to normal. So there's resting pressure with systole or with every heartbeat that pressure goes up. And then the arteries will rebound pushing the blood further into the, uh, the arterial system, and then pressure will return to normal. This is what we would expect. A normal, gradual increase and return to normal of pressure. Reduced compliance means that rubber is less flexible. It doesn't expand and contract as easily or the arteries are more rigid. This happens with cardiovascular disease, this happens with atherosclerosis, the development of plaques, calcifying of the arteries, they become harder. What does that hardness do? Well, I'm using an example here of a, a plastic pipe. It should be fairly intuitive that this won't flex as you inject water or inject blood into it. What the pressure graph looks like in this case is much different. We see this large spike in pressure. Blood that's injected into this tube doesn't, it's not accepted by the tube. Pressure spikes. It moves in quickly and then it's forced on quickly. The heart has to work hard to, to push blood through. You don't get the added effect of the recoil of the arteries and helping to propel blood. So blood pressure spikes. The spike is high blood pressure. And at the risk of getting too far into other cardiovascular diseases, you can see that in a situation like this, you are now more at risk of other adverse consequences. If this is a situation caused by arterial plaques, for instance, we're not going to go into how they, uh, they develop and how they progress, but imagine plaques on the inside of the wall. If pressure spikes, there's more pressure inside the artery there's more shear or friction of the fluid on the inside of the arterial wall. That means there's more likelihood that these plaques are going to rip off. Higher pressure through the existence of plaques 
means more likelihood the plaques will rupture, which means plaques grow in size, they develop more. So it's a, a vicious cycle. I do really find the atherosclerosis and uh, um, atherosclerotic plaques really interesting, but we don't really have time necessarily to talk about them too much now. Short and, and sweet, fish pills, omega-3s, break down plaques. I've never seen any evidence against um, fish pills. I take four every morning for that. Yeah, sounds like a lot. It sounds like a lot. Four every morning. It used to be six. A lot of the, um, a lot of the work that um, there was a, um, a researcher at Guelph when I was doing my PhD, he did some um, like high test, high DHA fish pill studies with uh, chronic patients looking at the uh, progression of atherosclerotic plaques and how the DHA and its, its, um, its active form in the body will reverse the signaling cascade that makes the plaques grow. So it actually shrinks plaques and helps to heal that, that lesion in the arteries. They were using six to eight grams per day. And that's essentially like a high dose of medication in that case. So I just figure four per day is probably good in a preventative manner. Big horse pills, yeah, absolutely. The 600, 300. Yeah, yeah. 600 DHA or EPA and 300 DHA. No. Eat them in the morning with a nice big heavy dose of oatmeal that kind of like layers on top. No fish burps, nothing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I digress. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> fish pills, fantastic to prevent these spikes and the, the rupture and progression of uh, plaques in the arteries. Also really good for cognitive development. If that's something that you're interested in. What else can you do? Those are, uh, those are dietary interventions, and being in a, well, being in a human kinetics bubble, we often kind of ignore the dietary interventions. We leave that for those individuals across campus, but I really think it's important to consider both halves of the equation, right? Energy in, energy out, food in, exercise. It's really important to at least acknowledge that that plays a role in the balance that we're trying to create. Um, on our side of the pond, exercise therapy is really, um, really potent in reducing hypertension. Even one bout of exercise can lower blood pressure over the course of the day. And I'll show you some results um, showing that in a second. Hypertension, very responsive to exercise, even though the exercise itself requires blood pressure to go up. The rest of the day, your blood pressure is usually lower than it would be had you not exercised. And even though the exercise makes blood pressure go up and that sounds bad, the benefits afterwards outweigh the brief uh, periods of higher blood pressure that uh, you'd see with exercise. And it doesn't have to be big exercise, long exercise, or intense exercise. Just increasing physical activity, walking around more, taking the stairs, not taking the elevator. We see improvements on the order of four to nine millimeters of mercury. If you improve fitness, so cardiorespiratory fitness, your VO2 max, if that goes up, that can improve uh, blood pressure values as well. Losing weight has uh, five to 20 millimeters of mercury attributable to it alone. Reducing sodium intake, two to eight millimeters of mercury. All of these are independent and additive. So doing all of them together, you can expect, uh, what, 11 to 37 millimeters of mercury reduction in blood pressure. That's what the numbers add up to, but I'm going to show you that they're not completely additive, there's a little bit of a, a blunting effect because there's some crossover, there's some overlap. But each will have some effect on lowering blood pressure in the body. You don't get the complete um, therapeutic benefits by only doing physical activity or only reducing sodium intake. All of these together will help to reduce resting tension. We have some idea that 
physical activity and fitness are really beneficial for hypertension from the aerobic center longitudinal study. This is one that I mentioned way back in week one of the course. We talked about uh, some of the, the accelerations in exercise physiology research and the aerobic center longitudinal series of studies was one of those. This is an 18-year follow-up study, or this data is from an 18-year follow-up. Actually, I'm probably sure there is new and updated information that I should add here at some point. But the point here is that blood pressure is reduced or hypertension is improved, both with higher fitness across the bottom, left to right, and with just an increase in normal daily activity on the right-hand side from back to front. 16,000 individuals, and this is self-report, but at, at, uh, with this magnitude, that's really all we can rely on. Um, sedentary WJR is walker, jogger, runner, so loose, unstructured activity. And then sports players, you can see the largest effect in reducing the incidence of hypertension is in sports players with a high cardiorespiratory fitness. The highest incidence of hypertension is sedentary, well, it's not sedentary with low, it's technically walker, jogger, runners with low cardiorespiratory fitness, but we're going to ignore that 0.8 or 0.9% uh, percent differential. It's at the top back left of this graph. You see a nice progressive decline as you do more and are more fit at the front right corner. So fitness and activity seem to impact hypertension. What kind of activity do you need to do? And I used to have this as a, a breakout session where we would like work in groups and you could brainstorm amongst yourselves. Um, instead, I'm summarizing it for you nicely here, which usually means that you don't take the information up as well. But this is important stuff, and it's generally the uh, the aerobic prescription that we have for uh, healthy lifestyle benefits anyways. Um, the best prescription to reduce hypertension is endurance exercise every day, resistance exercise two to three days per week. So frequency is fairly moderate to high. The intensity of exercise is manageable at a moderate pace. 40 to 60% of VO2 max or VO2 reserve. I'm using those interchangeably, even though they're technically slightly different. And uh, for resistance exercise, 60 to 80% of your one repetition max. A moderate intensity is all that's required to confer these hypertensive benefits. The asterisk is here to point out that the research suggests that the benefits are proportional to the intensity. The higher intensity, the greater the benefit as far as uh, reducing hypertension goes. But it's also not written on this, uh, this slide because research at high intensities in hypertensive individuals is controversial and therefore lacking. Right? If you are hypertensive, you don't really want to participate in high-intensity exercise because your blood pressure spikes even more in those situations. But as we start to realize that it is handled well by those individuals, it's still relatively safe, we're getting a really nice picture that even higher-intensity exercise provides some really nice therapeutic benefits. But the official word is moderate. That's the official safe word in... Um, exercise prescription. How much do you have to do? 150 minutes per week, which translates to about 30 minutes per day, 30 to 60 minutes per day of endurance exercise, or two to three sets of 10 to 12 reps of resistance exercise in the gym. What type do you want to do? Anything that's safe. Anything that doesn't require a high degree of skill that you can easily participate in, that isn't going to discourage those individuals from engaging in activity. And you're probably noticing everything I'm describing 
can be applied not only to hypertension, but just an exercise program in general. And you'll see that this prescription is repeated in any um, public health message uh, that, that you'll see for the general population. 10,000 steps per day, exercise 150 minutes per week, moderate intensity, safe activities is the general uh, status quo for um, any exercise uh, regimen advice. So potent effects of this type of prescription in reducing hypertension. Don't just trust me. Let's look at it. Let's look at the effects of intensity. I told you that some of the, uh, the work to date suggests only moderate intensity, but we're getting updated information to say that more intense or vigorous exercise might also help improve hypertension. This is a really nice dose response study that looks at nine hour ambulatory blood pressure after an exercise intervention. And this is a really common uh, measurement. And it's really nice to make that measurement because it doesn't limit blood pressure assessment to in the lab, right before or after exercise with a clinical professional. It removes the idea of white, uh, white coat hypertension and gets a sense of what free living blood pressure would be. Nine hours after the exercise, the uh, average change in blood pressure over those nine hours. This series of studies was done in already uh, prehypertensive men with a baseline systolic blood pressure of 128 millimeters of mercury to give you a sense of the type of hypertension we're dealing with. So not normal, not hypertensive by the new guidelines, but almost hypertensive. And I don't have resting diastolic pressure, oddly enough. Let's focus on systolic. Either way, you'll see the same dose response benefit. So what this graph is telling you, this is the change in blood pressure over the nine hours. So from this baseline, if you don't do any exercise and you measure blood pressure over nine hours, the average pressure, the average systolic pressure over nine hours is about 138 <laughs> millimeters of mercury. So in these overweight, uh, or no, no, yeah, overweight and prehypertensive men, they come into the office, they get their baseline pressure taken, no exercise, they go about their day, over nine hours, systolic pressure is higher, diastolic pressure relatively unchanged. Now, if you add exercise to the mix, that's where things get really interesting. You do low intensity exercise, and you don't see as much of an increase in systolic pressure you will in fact see a decrease in diastolic pressure over those nine hours. And that effect is improved as intensity goes up. With moderate exercise, we see a, a further blunting of systolic pressure over those nine hours, and a larger decrease in diastolic pressure. With vigorous exercise, there's no increase in systolic pressure over nine hours of a normal workday. Diastolic pressure drops in a nice linear fashion. One exercise bout in hypertensive overweight men. They stay prehypertensive throughout the day, whereas in a normal resting situation, you might argue that they are or they have hypertension. So a nice linear dose response where more intense exercise confers greater protection um, a greater reduction or blunting of blood pressure over the course of a nine-hour measurement period. Oh, and this might have been nice information to have initially. Low, moderate, and vigorous exercise are shown here. 40 minutes at 40% of VO2 max for low, just to get a sense of the type of exercise. 40 minutes at 60% for moderate. And then vigorous is a VO2 max test, basically. That's pretty strong, pretty intense exercise. Really promising results though, right? This is a phenomenon known as post-exercise hypotension. 
if you're ever interested and you're looking for the research, PEH, post-exercise hypotension. And it is repeatable. It is a robust effect. A singular exercise bout will reduce blood pressure for hours afterwards. So you might be sitting there thinking, and I don't blame you, I don't really want to do a VO2 max test every day to protect myself against high blood pressure. What if, and this is the line of thinking that a lot of people used in the development of aerobic interval training or high intensity interval training, which you've undoubtedly heard about, repeated sprints at 90% of VO2 max or 100% of VO2 max. But the benefit here is these sprints are only like two to three minutes. They're really short. In a comparison of aerobic interval training to moderate intensity training, this is uh, the type of exercise that we're doing here. Four minutes at 90%, done four times. That's the aerobic intervals. Still somewhat difficult, but not impossible. This is 16 minutes of exercise. With rest, it might be about half an hour of, of uh, a visit to the gym, a really short duration workload, and that's the benefit of these aerobic intervals. Versus 47 minutes at 60%, typical classic moderate intensity exercise. What we're looking at is systolic on the left, diastolic on the right. In both cases, lower blood pressure. This is, again, um, ambulatory blood pressure, but instead 24 hours instead of nine lower blood pressure with aerobic intervals compared to moderate intensity exercise in both systolic and diastolic cases. No change in control like you'd expect. You come in for your measurement. You get a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure uh, assessment done. There's no reason blood pressure should drop. Post-exercise hypotension only works with exercise. These control individuals are just walking around doing their normal day-to-day -day life, no difference, and we see a really nice progressive decrease. Moderate intensity provides some benefits, but these intervals double uh, the drop in diastolic pressure, and you could argue two and a half times the drop in systolic pressure with less time in the gym. I mean, four minutes at 90% is no cakewalk, but spending only 25 to 30 minutes at the gym in a given day, it's really hard to argue against not having time for that, right? Really potent results, a really good rationale for uh, that kind of exercise and tackling hypertension. Lastly, a little bit of uh, work that I want to show you comparing different types of exercise. We used to do roundtable discussions in the course where every week on like a Friday we'd have a series of papers. You're going to do paper discussions at the end of the course, but we would do it for 12 weeks. And these were the papers that, um, that we looked at uh, in the hypertension section. And they all typically followed the same kind of format. One group would look at what's the effect of intensity? What's the effect of uh, mode? This is aerobic versus resistance. That's another comparison that I used to like to make. And it's not the best comparison because this is a resistance circuit. It's really high rep, low weight resistance exercise. So it's also very cardiovascular, but there isn't a lot of, uh, a lot of research to compare the two directly. What we're looking at here is the post-exercise hypotension effect over the course of a nine hour workday in treadmill exercise versus resistance exercise when compared to control. And like you might expect, both of the exercise groups saw a spike in mean blood pressure initially. Exercise makes blood pressure go up. But then as soon as the exercise was done, 15 minutes later, we see this nice drop in mean blood pressure that lasted. This is... Maybe it's seven hours. Maybe it's seven hours, not nine hours. Regardless, doesn't matter. Uh, over the course of a normal workday where they did the same ambulatory blood pressure measurements, 
seven hours afterwards, let's call this a typo, uh, both groups still lower than control, and you start to see a little bit of separation. The treadmill exercise, these squares, tended to be a bit lower at the end of the workday than the resistance group. Arguing that maybe aerobic exercise is better than typical weights in the gym, or in this case, a resistant circuit. Not sure how that correlates with um, two to three sets of 10 to 12 reps of classic resistance exercise, but if there's already a bit of separation, you can imagine that uh, typical resistance exercise might uh, be a bit worse off at the end of a workday. That's speculation. I can't say that for sure. Uh, but certainly treadmill exercise has a, a large benefit over the course of a seven-hour workday in this case. Also kind of interesting to notice that the, uh, the mean blood pressure gradually goes up over the course of the day. As you're around the office, maybe you're stressed by the day-to-day -day demands of whatever your work job is. Everything creeps up, which is fantastic news for you leaving university and getting into that office setting, isn't it? Um, this is one, one instance where we're not separating, separating out systolic and diastolic pressure. This is mean pressure. And you might have it on your slide. So when I ask you, do you remember what the formula is to calculate mean pressure from those values, you might have it in front of you, but do you remember what it is to calculate mean pressure? Yeah? You think? Okay, and? Fantastic, that's at rest. Mean blood pressure at rest is two-thirds systolic plus one-third diastolic. What is it during exercise? Is it different during exercise? Would I have asked you that question if it were the same? During exercise, it's one half systolic and one half diastolic. Why is it one half and one half during exercise? Your heart rate's faster. Heart rate's faster. Absolutely. The cardiac cycle happens more frequently. Systole takes up half of the cardiac cycle during exercise. We shorten the resting portion, and so it's uh, more of a one-to-one -one relationship. At rest, systole, your heart beating, only takes up a third of the cardiac cycle. The rest is longer. The space between beats is longer. 